Uh, my name is Ted Kasich, and uh, I'm a professor here in the Daniels faculty, and it's uh, been my privilege for a number of years now to coordinate the uh, Building Ecology, Science, and Technology lecture series. And uh, it's now entering its sixth year here at the University of Toronto. Uh, it's an interesting lecture series, but I'm biased, of course, uh, because it focuses on specialized topics of interest to the design profession by inviting leading researchers and practitioners to share their perspectives on the emerging intersection between ecology, science, and technology in the built environment. I wish to extend our sincere appreciation for the generous support provided by Tremco Roofing and Maintenance for now the sixth consecutive year. Without their support, this event would not be possible. Um, for those of you who are from the profession, each lecture qualifies for two hours of OAA structured learning credits. And um, you, of course, have to fill out the forms and try to print clearly. Otherwise, we will have to hold these lectures in the pharmacy building so that we can have qualified staff to decipher your email addresses. And uh, that's something I'm hoping we don't have to resort to. Uh, before introducing this evening's uh, speaker, I'd like to invite Bill Corrigan of uh, Tremco to welcome you personally to tonight's lecture. Bill? Thanks, Ted. Um, as Ted mentioned, this is our sixth year sponsoring the uh, Best Lecture Series, and uh, I gotta tell you, it's pretty inspiring to see a full house every event, year after year after year, including the overflow room. That's, that's inspiring, and it's inspiring to me to see a mix of young professionals mixed with some wily old veterans um, attending these events. And so, welcome. Welcome from Tramco Roofing and Building Maintenance. Um, I'll be available actually after for some wine and cheese and some discussion and if anybody's interested in ever coming over to uh, to tour our facilities, you know, we're a proud manufacturing facility that's been on Wicksteed Avenue and Leaside since 1928. Um, a zero landfill facility and uh, we give tours and uh, we're pretty proud of, uh, of our accomplishments and some of the new innovative uh, manufacturing practices that we've implemented recently. So again, Thank you, and, uh, and welcome, and enjoy the session tonight. Well, most of you in the room probably, in one way or another, know David Sizem, but he's the founding principal of Mon Montgomery Sizem Architects, a Toronto-based firm uh, with over 35 years' experience in the fields of healthcare, education, urban infrastructure, and housing. David was named a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada in 1998, and for the past several years, he has served on the City of Toronto's design review panel. So if you're getting a rough go of it, it's probably not because of David, it would be the other unruly members that serve on that committee. Um, <laughs> there's much ecology in the Montgomery Sizem portfolio of built work. Um, in particular, along the uh, social and sensible dimensions. The, Holistic perspective adopted by David's firm continues to exert meaningful influence on our cultural ecology in two ways. Uh, for the inhabitants of the building who enjoy the building space, and for the upcoming designers who are exposed to this humanistic design thinking. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome uh, back David Sizem to this room. He has a 50-year history with this room, he told me this evening. And he's going to share some of that with us. And uh, I'd like to welcome him. David. Yeah, I think I fall in the wily old veteran category because I said to Ted that this, uh, I realized as I walked in here that I, I have a longer than 50 year relationship with 103. First as a student starting in 1963, then as a teacher, then as an attendee to these lectures. It was a sobering thought, but anyway. Um, this talk is based on a, <clears throat> a recently published book on our work. Um, and in that book, I wrote um, about four themes which are germane to the, the nature of the work. Um, and the, the book probably covered more of the work and less of the themes, and the talk is more of the themes and less of the work. Um, the title of the book comes from a quote by the late architect Alda Van Eyck, um, 
And essentially, it's just this suggestion that place and occasion um, has more implied humanistic and uh, evocative qualities than the more abstract um, um, terms of space and time. And that's, that's where the, the root of that. The four themes that I'm going to talk about are light and air, economy of means and generosity of ends, transcending expectations, and the places between. Light and air would seem a, a kind of obvious um, life-giving force to, to architecture. We do a lot of work, however, in healthcare, and light and air isn't always um, uh, on the high uh, part of the list. And um, so I'm going to actually talk about light and air under three uh, titles. The first one, an early experience. In the early days of our practice, which is a long time ago, we were given the opportunity to alter, uh, alterations and additions to long-term care facilities. And this opportunity, although serendipitous, affected uh, significantly the work, um, uh, subsequent work of the firm. Um, upon entering any one of these long-term care facilities, the, there was a kind of sensory meltdown. There was uh, um, bad smells, glaring lighting, um, institutional lighting. Um, the, there was a material pal that looked like a hospital that had gone under way too many budget cuts. It just was a terribly, terribly depressing place. Usually nine foot ceilings, acoustic tile, the public rooms would be identified because you would have perhaps a few more two by four fluorescent fixtures in the public rooms. Um, as a resident, when you came out of the room in the corridor, you'd look down one way and see a fire exit door blank, and then you look down the other way and you'd see the nurse's station with a big nurse's panel behind it to remind you of why you were there as if you hadn't realized it. Um, real private space was virtually non-existent uh, in spite of privacy curtains and so on. All this was bad enough, but the real impression that we got in working in these places was the, was the uh, it stands out above all others was a degree to which the inside was separated from the outside world. And indeed, you know, when you visited these places, when you left, there was a great sense of relief. Uh, that was an option not mo open to most residents. So if these facilities were what the experts at the time thought appropriate, then perhaps our inexperience at the time, our naivety, and our singular desire not to end up in such a place drove uh, us to imagine a new paradigm for this building type, a paradigm that uh, had ideas more rooted in normalcy uh, and of home, which of course is where most of these residents came from. A very early project, almost 40 years ago, was an addition to a long-term, this is the first project, addition to a long-term care facility in Tilsonburg. And, uh, and you can see that it's, uh, it's kind of rooms in a roof, but on the other side, it had a single loaded corridor, and the single loaded corridor had sitting areas off of it, um, doors to rooms, shutters to rooms with little uh, places to sit. And um, it, it had, we, in fact, when we did the presentation, we likened this more to a kind of promenade deck uh, on a ship, and, and lots of light, light and air, obviously. Uh, and these ideas really came from a number, number of precedents, some of them healthcare and some of them not. Um, Monasteries with their cloisters, and in fact, monasteries were actually the early healthcare facilities because they would always have a component that dealt with travelers who were, were ill. Um, if you think of this photograph, which is Christopher Wren at the Royal Ch Hospital in Chelsea, and you think back to that early photograph of the, of the, of the long-term care facility, you kind of wonder how, how we've done in the last you know, 400 years um, because this has daylight, natural wood, you know, nice lighting, and so on. And of course, um, the sanatoria where the very sort of embrace of light and air is, is part of the cure. This is Doiker's sanatorium in, uh, near, near Hillis in the Zonestral. And these are, these, are, these are the kind of influences that um, um, we had. And, and, and we saw, and these places were part of a sort of a his, a, a historical and cultural continuum as opposed to being a specific response simply to technical and uh, functional requirements. 
skinny buildings. Well, as you can imagine, if uh, light and air is important to us, then um, skinny buildings make sense because um, they embrace light and air. And you could say skinny buildings maybe don't perform that well uh, because of the you know the, the you know the perimeter um, built area. area. But um, they do get lots of daylight, and they are, uh, um, you know, uh, through ventilation is a possibility. So our work in healthcare is actually encouraged as much as possible to have these buildings where you can actually, uh, you know, connect to light and air. Um, this is uh, a, a kind of um, a figured ground map of an actual hospital, and um, as I said, the healthcare world light and air is not always uh, significant. It's odd because uh, the research on patients in hospitals and how they do suggests, and it's fairly well-supported research, that if there's a view of the outside, particularly of a green space at a park, that the uh, healing time speeds up. However, for the staff, who are there actually all the time, as opposed to the patients that are there briefly, uh, you can see that uh, the, a lot of it is um, um, without light. In fact, Diana Anderson, a qualified architect and hospital doctor, has lamented, quote, a large part of my hesitation in pursuing advanced clinical training was because of what I considered an intolerable hospital setting. Staff facilities are frequently without windows, and I found myself desperately anticipating the first ray of sunlight after a long shift. Um, this discrepancy regarding what is good for patients and what is good for staff, I think, is uh, akin and is mis misguided logic to the uh, New Hampshire seatbelt law, which suggests that uh, you're not going to have any accidents after you're 18 years old. Um, recent clinical studies, have, as I say, have supported the healing benefits of aspects to, uh, of uh, access to light and daylight in the actual environment. And indeed, this has a history um, back before sophisticated mechanical systems and so on. Florence Nightingale was um, extolling the virtues of, of light and air. And indeed, uh, um, pavilion hospitals uh, like this were the, were the norm. And as we find that a lot of people are getting sick from going to hospitals, you know, it may in fact change the whole nature of the place. And uh, we may see more of this. The architectural implications of uh, built form uh, led Sir Leslie Martin, who was a, a British architect and head of the School of Architecture at Cambridge, to form in 1967 the Center for Land Use and Built Form, now known as the Martin Center. Martin and his colleagues wanted to show how particular built forms could mitigate uh, the impact of higher densities. To that end, they were concerned about the potential of built form to create a sense of place and to optimize uh, the quality of the exterior space. This is one of the seminal diagrams of their work. It's called the Fresnel Square. And every segment of this is equal in area. So if you take the two extremes, the thin um, outer piece is the same area in total as the inner, as the center one. If you kind of project this to, a, say, a city grid, you can see on the right that the uh, Thin buildings form street-related buildings with the potential of courts in the middle. And on the left, the thick floor plate buildings are centered on the, on the blocks with, with uh, I would say, some sort of residual space behind. So I think it's actually a fairly powerful notion. It's not surprising that this research uh, took place in Cambridge, a city where um, uh, characterized by skinny buildings created by uh, streets and courts. This is a project, uh, very briefly, just showed a couple of slides that, that it illustrates this. Um, this is a, a long-term care facility to, for the deaf up in, uh, near Barry. But you can see here uh, the communal facilities that you saw, which are along here, and then the four uh, home areas in, embracing courtyards. Um, the third aspect of the uh, um, 
light, light and air is working the plan. This is, of course, the Noli plan of Rome, where the white areas are the public spaces, um, most of them exterior, but some of them actually interior. And the Noli plan is kind of a per precursor to the figure ground drawings that we do. And it, 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 it has the ability to convey in two dimensions some three-dimensional kind of uh, sensibility. Um, what we do actually is use this figure ground in uh, not only kind of urban design things, but we ur urban design building. So that in fact the um, top two projects, which are our projects, show uh, these are long-term care facilities. The uh, access to light and air, daylight, and single-loaded corridors, and public spaces with rooms around them, and, and code conditions dictate different different forms. So this one also tries to do that. Now this is an actual project, but you can see that that's a, a very sort of um, inward-looking and centered uh, project. I mean, the appropriate hierarchy and disposition of public spaces within the plan is at the root of a building's engagement with outdoor place and a significant grading context for orientation. The notion of urban design and buildings actually is touched upon in Gordon Cullen's book, Townscape, where he talks about indoor landscape and outdoor rooms, humanizing both by seeing each in a fresh way and borrowing characteristics from one another. And Fumiko Maki has described uh, the uh, most recent uh, section of the Museum of Modern Art as a, as a wonderful piece of urban design with the kind of uh, views to the Manhattan streetscape, the views of, of, of uh, um, flow of fellow visitors and so on. Now, there's such thing in healthcare, there's a new movement called lean design. Lean design is a preoccupation about efficiency uh, an organizational framework to maximize value and minimize waste in the design and operation of healthcare facilities. And that's commendable. But bad lean design has the same corrosive effect on buildings as bad traffic engineering has on cities. And uh, you can have situations where distances are mandated and when you actually respect those distances, you end up with plans that are incredibly uh, fat and, and, and inward looking. This particular ex example actually is of a, a project that we were involved in in Saskatchewan. It's part of this P3 um, format. So we inherited a plan here. This is a, a, a long-term care home area, bedrooms around a, a, a center of kitchen, dining, living. The daylight to the public area is here. And of course the rooms have windows, but uh, and, and, and how they, this, this came about was that there was mandated distances to rooms from here and views from rooms to there. But so preoccupied were the architects who did this with that, with th those conditions that they failed to see that you could actually do this, which is what we did to kind of reorganize the thing, still have those distances, end up with light all along here in these areas and, and actually a, a small uh, public area with a view in another direction. So it's, you know, it's a problem of actually perception and, and, and recognizing the importance of access to light and air. Um, most of our projects you know, have uh, uh, that as a preoccupation. I'm just gonna show a, a few here. Um, this is in addition to uh, uh, St. John's Rehab Hospital, uh, with, we did with the Faro Partnership. Um, you can see, oops, sorry. You can see the addition here, uh, and we definitely wanted to make more of a connection with the ravine than the uh, hospital previously had. The program consisted of large rehabilitation gyms, associated clinical offices, a new therapy pool, and a central canopy. Uh, and, and here you can see the, uh, those are the, these are these large gyms the pool here. We have single loaded corridors around a courtyard which is on the ravine. And the corridors are actually a very important part in rehabilitation hospital because people relearn their gait and so on by walking them. So if it's a miserable corridor that you're trying to practice in, it's not a very pleasant experience. 
and so that uh, in this case, this is the pool with uh, daylight at the end. This is where you enter and the single loaded corridor goes along here with this courtyard and view out. And, and the gym, although it's internal, uh, has windows which look out through the corridor to the outside. So there's this kind of transparency that, it, that exists. Um, just down the street here in McCall's Ronald McDonald House, um, which we did, um, it's, uh, the program is for families with children with very seriously ill who are typically at Sick Kids Hospital uh, or, um, um, you know, the, uh, one of the hospitals there, but most, for the most part, Sick Kids. Our kind of, um, it, it was actually a fabulous site because this is Henry Street, which is really the f first full residential street west of the, uh, in, uh, the institutional district where the hospitals are. So we actually were on Henry Street. There was a parking lot here before. And uh, we, we actually refer to this as a house in, in, in a garden in the city. Uh, and we tried to make these, uh, again, these kind of court, courts uh, that you see there. So there are, uh, you can see in the, in the ground floor, the public area has views out to the street and into the court here and, and here. Um, there's dining here, lounge here, there's a small school, and there's single loaded corridors along this part of the uh, uh, wing where the rooms, the bedrooms are. So on the ground floor you can see the, uh, you know, the lounge space bridging here. There's a kind of walk, uh, a landscape walkway here. There's one type of court, a quieter court here, a more active court here where the school is, and this is all, all dining along here. And that shows in the top where you enter and come in. It's a large aquarium and a view out. And this is the dining facility with views to Henry Street and back to the courtyard. Of, with, and, and with different kind of seating arrangements because sometimes families want to sit by themselves or sit, you know, w in, a, in a larger group. And upstairs, the single loaded corridors with sitting areas so they, one could actually put a child to bed, turn out the lights, because the, the rooms are for the whole family, so you, if you turn out the lights and you're in there, you're, you don't have it. So that we made these sitting areas outside so that they could kind of sit outside the room and read while their, their child was asleep. This is the more active courtyard with a kind of playhouse in the middle, which is this. And there, there's the, um, the corridors at night. You can see the different colors and uh, Charlie Pachter painting, which is went there. And there are blackboards that you can see here uh, on the rooms and the bedrooms. Uh, and then the last one I'll show here is the uh, uh, Sister of St. John the Divine. They're the people who actually built St. John's Rehab, and this is their, their um, uh, monastic home. They rebuilt this. This is an entry. and. Uh, it's really just, the same. this is an existing guest house. This is a new accommodation for them. There are libraries and so on here. And the, the, the kind of centerpiece is the chapel and a refectory. And uh, I'll show those just quickly. As you come in the chapel, the chapel not only brings in north light, but it actually is a, is a, is a lantern as you approach the home. And you can see the uh, inside of the chapel here, which is quite enclosed at the lower level, but brings in light from above shot of the entry. Um, economy, means, and generosity of ends. Uh, we, most of our work are for nonprofits. Uh, we have very small budgets typically, um, really small budgets. And uh, so the exercise is to try and make uh, the budget stretch as much as possible. And I want to go through a few um, I guess strategies uh, to do do that, um, and these are the three that I want to talk about. A matter of priority is simply if you have a, a, a you know a facility that you're making that's a very low budget, you you have to pick your spots. So they can be very simple things that just make it that much different than a very uh, you know kind of banal building. And I just to show a couple. I mean, this is a 
Sister Margaret Smith Addiction Treatment Center in Thunder Bay, and just very simple things like this conical skylight and the, and the wood in the corridor. Uh, in the Island Yacht Club, just this uh, monitor in the roof, which is, lets daylight in, and, and at night when the sailors come in, it's kind of a, a, a beacon. But very, very simple things. Now, the, the other thing about a tight budget, you've got two things you can do. You can either reduce area or um, change the cost per square foot, because the more area you have, the less the cost per square foot. And so we're always trying to get as much cost per square foot as possible by, by reducing area. But you don't want to reduce the area to the point where it's simply um, you know, not, not working. And, and uh, this is a project we did for Extendicare, which are a private provider. But what's interesting, this was built at 565 square feet per resident, which was when the 20,000 beds came in Ontario was the most economical of all the homes. And this, this uh, uh, and Santiago Kunzel is here uh, with me in, on this, and th th this is a home area. And you can see that there are single loaded corridors still. We actually had bedrooms that were 20 square feet larger than um, the uh, required. and. Uh, uh, views down outside of out to corridors, and and it's really a struggle with the plan to actually try and make that make those things work. So you actually have a plan that gives you those benefits, but at the same time, you know, can give you a bit more on a cost per square foot basis. Uh, one of the byproducts of a tight budget is diminished range of materials. Um, this is not the world of sumptuous galleries and museums, but rather inexpensive normative buildings. And uh, we have, uh, you know, vinyl siding is not a wonderful material, but um, there are times when in these projects where we're actually faced with having to use that. And I guess we actually kind of looked at um, precedents for that. And when you, you look at um, Louis Berrigan's houses in, in, uh, for very rich people in Mexico, they're really, they're stucco and they're simply planes of, stuck of different color. So they're not uh, uh, terribly expensive buildings. And if you look at, um, you know, St. Petersburg even, which is a, um, you know, exemplar of urbanism, it's, it's, it's basically a stucco city with wood, with, with uh, sorry, stone, stone trim. So when we use these materials, we try and this is a uh, this is actually a rendering. It's now nearing completion in Thunder Bay long-term care and, and uh, seniors housing, is is to actually use color variation on, on the ground. Um, this is a, a home in uh, Nepean near Ottawa, which has got hardy plank, but it does have these bay windows and chimneys, which alleviate the kind of banality of the uh, of the cheaper materials. And Greenwood School, uh, this was an existing office building that we redid in stucco. It's a stucco building, very inexpensive. But it does have, you know, wired in stone at the base where you actually enter and touch um, the building. Multivalence is actually, uh, it's, it's not this, the, the kind of idea of a, of a flexible space that's good for everything and good for nothing. It's about a space that gets used in many, many different ways. And uh, an example, a very good example of that is in Greenwood College School, where this um, atrium piece uh, ventilates the, the school. There's air ventilation. There's light that comes into classrooms that look onto it. Uh, there's a climbing wall, because physical activity is very much part of the kind of curriculum of the place. And it's the fly tower for the theater. So all of those things happen in this space, and all of them happen quite, quite well. And a much sort of simpler level, this is uh, some seniors' apartments at Belmont House, where the residents don't feel, they're not in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, they don't want handrails, so, but this is a kind of wainscoting, which is flat, but it, it can act as a handrail. You can put your hand down and it has little, uh, in fact, it has little notches that you can see there, so that if, you, uh, if your um, sight is impaired, that you can feel where the, where the you know, the the door starts. But that, that, again, that's kind of multivalence because it's actually looking like simply a piece of nice wood trim, but it's actually operating in a different levels. I'll show you one project in this uh, uh, um, category of uh, economy of means, this Island Yacht Club. The Island Yacht Club burned down, I can't remember the date, but, and we were hired to rebuild it. 
It had to be rebuilt with the money from the insurance, which was not a lot. It's a summer place, it's not, so it's delightful. You don't have to worry about insulation and so on. It's, uh, and it's for people who'd rather be outside, so. Um, but very simply, it's uh, two, two parallel bars. This is where the yachting basin is here. This uh, has in it the uh, restaurant, dining, uh, social spaces. This has the lockers. It, um, and it has a large outdoor component. It connects to the, an existing pool here. Forms a little courtyard where there's an eating uh, servery from the kitchen. And uh, these are just a couple of shots. This is courtesy of the uh, Liquor Licensing Board, which I was afraid you might fall down the steps. And, and simply, in this case, it's structural wood deck with uh, wood joists and steel beams. So it is the material that it's holding it up, but it's a material that's finished as well. Very, very tight budget in this project. But we still managed a stone fireplace. The third topic, transcending expectations. Um, I think, by the way, this quote here by Julie Eisenberg uh, in the book, Architecture is, Isn't Just for Special Occasions, is actually a very good, good one. Um, the, um, these are the two sections that I'm going to uh, talk about, the hidden potential gross up. There's a, in building programs, you typically get areas of program areas for different programs, and then you have what's called gross up, and it's kind of a, um, well, it actually includes all the circulation spaces and the stairs and so on, which can actually be the lifeblood of the building, but also includes walls, duct shafts, and, and other such things. And it's usually begrudgingly given, um, you know, it's always said the lower you can keep gross up, then the, you know, well, the better we'll be off. It's, it's, it's an odd, uh, I think a very odd situation. Um, and, you know, when you think of this scary hospital plan again, um, you, 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 you know, basically there's tons of program in there and the circulation is, uh, is kind of a, seen as a secondary uh, thing. Louis Kahn, um, and when he accepted the AIA gold medal in 1971 in Detroit, gave an acceptance speech entitled The Room, the Street, and Human Agreement. And in that lecture, he talked about a stair, and a stair that would have a landing with a bench, uh, a seat, fixed seat at the end, with a window overlooking the, uh, the neighborhood, and maybe some books, you know. So that if you were elderly and you were climbing the stair, or if you had a bad ankle like I have, you could kind of stop on the landing, sit down, admire the view, and not have to say that I'm, you know, I'm tired, I gotta have a rest. So it actually kind of preserves a sort of human dignity, and all that whole story is taking place in what's called gross up. And uh, so in our work, we try to actually deal with things like um, circulation space, not as just simply routes from place to another, but as galleries or connectors. This is a blur view looking over the pool. This is a, along the classrooms of the Arts Administration building out at uh, the University of Toronto at Scarborough with the um, um, green roof. And also a situation, this is at Belmont House project really quite a while ago at the long-term care where the, where the elevators actually, when you get out of the elevators, instead of staring at a nurse's station or some kind of internal thing, you get out and you see outside so you actually can orient yourself as to where you are. It's, it's really odd because cities, in this case Savannah, do it completely the opposite way. You, you, you actually lay out the street grid and set up those parks and streets and so on, and then you fill it in with buildings. Well, bu buildings, we do the opposite. So there's something uh, wrong there, and I think that, um, that, that, that that's a, a real struggle for architects to actually convince people of the, of the, uh, the, the benefits of that, of that space. Uh, our work in the field of healthcare, ranging from accommodation of long-term care residents, mental health patients, uh, to hospitals, rehabilitation, and complex continuing care has provided us with the opportunity to question and reconsider some of the prevailing uh, precepts of this type of work. 
Programs for these sort of facilities are most often based on a medical rather than a residential model. They emphasize what differentiates the patients or residents from everybody else as opposed to what they have in common. Uh, paradigms such as the house, the Grand Hotel, the village, and the garden are places infused with cultural tradition, fond memories, compelling images. And we can use them in, in contrast to the rather technical, clinical, uh, conventional focus of healthcare facilities. So we find them very useful to actually look at and, 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 and um, take advantage of. So in a project we did with KPMB at Providence Center, um, this is a, a room which probably is in, in, in this relation the closest thing to a house with kind of entry piece. This is a, a room at a senior's place. And you can see that the idea of making a room that you can occupy it and put your own things and actually really make it your own. Um, this is a, a, a bathroom. This is at uh, the Meehan home on Davisville. Um, but that's a bathroom for a typical room, and if I, I, I suggest if you go and look at long-term care facilities, you won't find too many bathrooms that look like that. And tub rooms, which actually but residents kind of dread going to because they're often put in lifts. It can be quite a scary experience. So, I mean, what we've tried to do is to make them as spa-like and uh, amenable and with warm wood and so on and so forth to make that experience um, more tolerable. And then, you know, in terms of the village or the, or the grand hotel, that you have these, you know, larger spaces which can, where the nine-foot grid with the more fluorescent ceiling isn't, the, isn't what you get, but you get rather, you know, more with lots of light. Uh, that was at Providence Center. This is at Norview Lodge in, in Simcoe. And finally, gardens. This is a, actually isn't ours. This was the garden that existed at Belmont House. It's a place that's kind of totally opposite to the hospital or thing because it's not program it's a place of delight it's a place that residents or patients can go out and uh, use you need shade and you need um, raised planters and so on just run through a few projects under this uh, title this is the um, Blurview um, Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital um, it's um, Rehabilitation and complex continuing care for uh, children, young ad adults, and their families. It's, it's, um, it's really an amazing place. It's got uh, research. It's got th therapy, education. It's, 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 it's got 75 inpatient beds. It's got laboratories, um, workshops. It, it's got a uh, school, which is also used by the neighborhood. It's got... Um, a pool and gym and so on and so forth. And I mean, the architectural vision was a kind of anti-hospital vision, one which uh, was of warmth, community, and welcoming. It's um, on the ravine, Sunnybrook is across here, and uh, it's on the ravine. Surface parking, unfortunately, is kind of a, because the Ministry of Health doesn't pay for parking, it's, it seems to go with these facilities, so that's a, unfortunate aspect, but it's kind of a, this um, shape building which gets lower at this point because we, we, we were dealing with the neighbors along here. They're cutouts for, for, for um, um, terraces. There's a very thin bridge here and then there's a, an effort to make that connection through to the ravine, ravine right as you arrive so you kind of know, know it. So you can see here the kind of uh, public spaces here going right through to the ravine and actually out to what's called the Spiral Garden, which was a, um, an outdoor place for, for the kids. Just a few shots of the, of the entry. When you arrive at the ravine, there's this family resource center, which has got a, a kind of a library part here, but this is the more informal part where they have receptions, if they have receptions, but where people come in and if they're waiting for somebody, they can sit down and use the computer and look outside to the terrace and, and go out the pool, again with lots of, sorry, um, lots of daylight coming in here. That's the gallery that you saw before. The bridge, there's a lot of artwork at different artists did installations here. The um, cafeteria, which is along the ravine. And finally, the bedrooms, which are very, very complex. The people, the inpatients here have really serious uh, uh, medical problems. So 
Um, they, there's a lot of technology put into this, but we're, we're, in spite of that, trying to make it as, um, um, as warm as possible. Uh, the Toronto, the George and Kathy Dabrowski Center for Horticulture. Um, this, uh, we were asked to do an addition which um, included a, an expanded library, a new administrati administrative offices, a store, a children's center, and upgraded meeting rooms. Um, there existed on, it used to be called the Civic Garden Center, and there was a, a Ray Moriyama building and a Jerry Markson building on the site. And what actually happened here uh, at the Civic Garden Center was that you would come in and go up a ramp to arrive, and you'd arrive at this level, and there was a receptionist behind here, and that was all that was at this level, and then either you'd go up again to offices or down to the store and so on. When I went to the interview, uh, we were competing, and I said, you know that you could have your ground floor on the same level as the gardens? And they actually didn't believe me because they'd been through this ramp situation. And I said, I can guarantee you that will happen, and they hired us, so. Um, so actually, the, the addition which goes out here, um, we cut away um, some of the Markson building here. This is the Moriyama building in 68, I think, and this is a more recent Markson building. We cut away part of it, used, reused the stone, and made this uh, addition come out here to create, to, to embrace the, the, the uh, botanical garden. The botanical garden actually had by far the largest part of the budget. Our budget was about uh, $3 million to do all the building, renovating and addition. So the idea is that the store, which is here, is this um, fritted glass, kind of box, which is a sort of mute sculptural element in the daytime and a, and a kind of lantern at night. We reused the, uh, it's hard to explain, get light back in here with this clear story. That's the uh, Moriyama building there, and the gardens came in here. This is actually some planting by Pete Udolf, who you may know of, who's a Dutch landscape guy who did, chose a lot of the planting for the High Line in New York. This just shows the, uh, the building in the, in the landscape. And we tilted the roof of, a, of, of, a, of the pavilion uh, so that when you were in the court, you could actually see the green roof, which had different kinds of plantings on it. And then when you're in the offices here, you can see across to the different kinds of plantings. So there was a kind of rationale for, for shaping this building to actually form a kind of uh, uh, a big front to it and then to dip down to the, to the courtyard. That's the uh, store, which has changed now. The store wasn't doing very well. I don't know what it was being used for. It had, at the lower level, views out, but fretted glass up here uh, and a shaped um, um, ceiling. And this is where we got light back into the uh, inner part. This is, these are existing steel beams, which we reused, put glass over top of them, put a clear story and then actually create a stair and an elevator. So you come in in the one level, and it connects much more with the, the gardens. The last uh, of the four topics uh, in, are the spaces between. Is the title on there? Yeah, it's hard to read. I, I, I'm amused by Sert's quote here. It says, in a period of a cult of the individual and genius, with all due respect to genius, it's not to them that we owe our cities, 1956. Uh, things haven't changed much, I think. That's probably a fairly uh, constant. In any event, um, I want to talk about this topic under two, two headings. One is building the city, and the other is establishing place. Um, we do live in an urban age. This is uh, the Endless City book, and you can see uh, 1900, 10% in urban situations, 2007, 50, and then by 2050, 75%. So there's a high rate of urbanization, and uh, we have to get it right. One, one way of looking at cities is density, uh, and density is actually a very good in some ways. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rationale for uh, um, um, you know, creating public transit systems. It's also interesting in this situation, this is Chicago, and this is an infrared view of Chicago showing greenhouse gas emissions. So this is Chicago showing 
the higher level of greenhouse gas emissions downtown, and as you get out to the suburbs, a lower level, and, and what you might think is a greener, uh, happier place. But the reality is, on a per, per capita basis, this is downtown Chicago uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, and here are the suburbs. So the fact of the matter is that the dense city uh, is working much better in terms of the, uh, those environmental concerns than the, than, the, than the suburban condition. And this is a pretty you know, graphic way of showing it. Uh, I mean, it's to the extent that something like um, uh, Poundbury or, or the Rocky Mountain Institute with all its bells and whistles, you know, you think as being uh, uh, environmental sort of uh, bellwethers. In, in fact, the Rocky Mountain Institute would be much better to build, just to, to occupy a, a downtown Boulder, Colorado, uh, building than to build this thing out in the, the suburbs where about, I think about 15 people come from, with very long drives. So, I mean, it's this kind of environmental, uh, this kind of anti-urban bias of the environmental movement, which is really um, um, hurting us, I think. And uh, it's interesting to note 3% of the nation's land mass in the United States generates 85% of its gross domestic product, that 3% of cities. For example, in Manhattan, the average resident generates 7.1 metric tons of greenhouse gases a year. The average resident in the US beyond Manhattan is 24.5 metric tons per resident. 82% of Manhattan residents get to work by either public transit, walking, or biking. And there's a very good book, and I'll show you a quote later on by David Owen called um, Green Metropolis, which makes this argument about uh, density. Now, density is a bit of a problem. It, it's kind of the mean average rainfall of urban metrics. So that if two cities that have the same mean average rainfall, they could be used, if, 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 if it all falls in one week, as opposed to falling you know, throughout the year, that's a very different situation. Yet the, the, the mean average rainfall is the same. The density is the same. And here you see, you know, if the world's population were concentrated, I mean, this is Paris and this is Houston, that's how much it would take up if, if you built the world as Houston. And it's interesting, because when you look at Houston, you think, oh, it was high rises, maybe that's kind of dense, but there's a lot of uh, parking, lot, service parking lots and a very low density perimeter. This is Amsterdam, which of course is a much, much denser city, but maybe doesn't appear to be the case. I mean, there's a congruism, congruence between urbanism, environmentalism, and the issues of public health that demand a more holistic, collaborative, and thoughtful approach to buildings themselves and to building in the city. Uh, one that views making the city a significant component of making a building in the city. And I think this is a, a very interesting quote, Peter Calthorpe, uh, in a very good book, Urbanism in the Age of Climate Change. It is kind of odd that Al Gore, who's written so much about the environment, in all his writing, uh, with a lot of technical, uh, you know, sports stuff, has never mentioned urbanism as a, as, 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 a, as a kind of way of dealing with climate change. And I think that's a, that's a real, real disconnect. And here, I, I have called this the sustainability iceberg. The things that are kind of above the line are the sort of more popular health care gets a lot, gets a lot of money gets a lot of talk, new technology, green roofs, solar panels, lead buildings. Well, down here, health gets, you know, when you look at the Ontario budget, 46% of the Ontario budget goes to health care. Health prevention gets about uh, I, a tenth of a percent or something, like just um, unbelievable. And so density and urban design, mixture of uses, design quality are, you know, very important aspects in terms of health, and they don't get credit for that. This again is another, this is David Owen and Green Metropolis and the thing about sustainability, it's not a microphenomenon, it's not a single thing, it's, it's all very interconnected. You can't have, as he says, a one-person democracy or a single company economy, it's a context. In 1995, uh, there was a heat wave in Chicago, um, significant heat wave, and uh, Jane Jacobs wrote about this in her book, The Dark Age Ahead. And uh, it lasted a couple of weeks, and uh, many more people died than was typical of a, 
of a heat wave, uh, mainly elderly residents. And so Chicago brought in 80 researchers from the uh, Center for Disease Control to find out why. There had been announcements during this heat wave that uh, people should try to go to air-conditioned spaces, drink lots of water, and so on and so forth. Although the water was shut off for a period of time during this heat wave. The researchers' obvious but unhelpful conclusions were that the residents died because they didn't seek out other places with water and air conditioning, as instructed by the authorities. They were locked in their apartments. Essentially, they were blaming the residents for their own fate. It took a young sociology student to have a look at this. He was originally from Chicago, and he noticed that in the two areas where this was uh, uh, an issue, there were 10 times more deaths in one area and another. And this is the area where there were fewer deaths, and this is the area where there were more deaths. Uh, this a thriving area where there were stores and so on, people could go to, and an area which was less thriving, which some boarded up buildings and so on and so forth. The researchers that came from the CDC couldn't look past the site of the actual deaths and, and, and actually did not make that connection out of the silo to the urban design issues of, uh, of, of, of the problem. And this is just simply, this is a guy who's a health consultant saying the most important decisions about health, public health will not be made by ministries of health. In fact, architects have a really, I think, major role in uh, health. In the U.S. between 1977 and 1995, the average distance people walked per day fell 42% while automobile use increased at three times the population growth. These are actually um, diagrams that Dr. Richard Jackson uh, showed. I remember seeing them and was just shocked. This is, uh, there are two sets. One is um, obesity, this is that, this one, and the other is uh, um, uh, diabetes. So in 1990, this was the map of the United States. And you can see that, that, that it goes from, you know, less to more. And essentially in two decades, the whole of the United States is transformed. Um, and that's, that's sh shocking. And Dr. Richard Jackson attributes a lot of that to the way we design cities. And, um, and in, there were two uh, uh, epide epidemiologists from St. Michael's who did something called the Diabetes Atlas. And uh, it was interesting because, oh, sorry, diabetes, uh, you know, tended to be in the inner suburbs uh, a little more largely and, and not in, this, in the, you know, the downtown core. It was also, and it's not shown in this map, there were, uh, United Way did a study called Poverty by Postal Code, and those, uh, and then they built our building and have built a number of community hubs in these areas. What's interesting is that there was a proposal called Transit City, which many of you might have heard of, and this was started under Mayor Miller and took transit into these areas. And during that time, partway through the Miller administration, the provincial government said, we, we're going to hold back funding, uh, delay it a bit, because we need it for health care. And then, of course, our most recent mayor said, get rid of the whole thing, it's a war on cars, you know, we don't want it. Um, but, the, but the fact is that people could not see Transit City as a health initiative. They saw it simply as a transportation exercise, and that's a, a serious, serious problem. I owe this slide and comment to Ted, actually. Um, we're constantly fighting when we're doing some, when we're working, for instance, at Donmont Court about street widths because the fire departments want the streets to be wider and wider and wider. And, um, you know, Ted said that uh, designing buildings and streets around fire trucks is like genetically engineering food to fit, exactly fit cooking utensils, which I thought was a great way of putting it. And, you know, there are all sorts of places in the world that have fire trucks that actually go down narrow streets and, and, and deal with the situation. These are you know, important issues. Um, for example, in Ronald McDonald House, if we had used the city's garbage pickup and we couldn't go to a private provider, half the building would disappear because these are the turning radiuses required. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things with like, like service vehicles and so on that are dictating the way we, we, make, we make buildings. And the grand visions haven't, haven't helped. Corb and Wright. And I'm even concerned uh, a recent project which um, 
was an international competition for the University of Manitoba Fort Garry campus. I don't know much about the competition other than this image that I saw. But and, and this is part of, I guess, a landscape urbanist uh, approach, which has many, many attributes, and there's some very nice projects. But Toronto's mean average temperature in January is minus one. Fort Garry's minus 18. And I, I just wonder what's going to happen between those buildings. Is it, are there tunnels or what? I mean, you know, because it's, it's a kind of idea that I think is, is, is problematic. And again, the streets, um, the, I mean, what's really going to determine the quality of your fabric is the nature of the built form as well as the diversity and mixture of uses. And uh, I think this is, again, this was from that same lecture that Khan gave uh, about this, and this is clearly not a street that is a, a community room. It's just simply a road, which is a collector road, a one-dimensional piece. I just want to show you one small project that I think conveys this idea of built form being so important. It's uh, by Peter Cardew. It's a large house uh, on a big lot in Shaughnessy. And he designed, uh, he, there's an idea of a garden wall for the house. The yard was very, very big. And then that's interpreted as a garden wall house. And there's a series of courtyards in here. So that this house maintains a garden with a garden wall. These uh, um, spaces are, are in here, and there's a wall along the laneway. I talked to Peter after uh, this, and uh, it was defeated by the local residents. And, you know, it's, it's really um, sad because, in fact, it improves the, probably improves the laneway, it's, it pr improves the quality of that, and it provides more accommodation. Uh, this is um, Belmont House in Toronto, where, where, the, where the building, which was a very a long-term care uh, program, uh, which has very sp specific relationships, but, but it, we, we did actually you know, shape the building to the urban, the urban condition, and you, you enter here into a, into a courtyard, just as you entered the old building into a courtyard, and we maintained this green space along, along Belmont. When it's not a city, the whole issue is establishing um, place, and ultimately it is a sense of reciprocity between building and site that's actually the, which, which creates places that play a dignified and lasting role. And um, I want to show you, again, a few precedents. This is the uh, Charleston Single House. It's a one-room deep house with a kind of a port, porch veranda that you enter from the street, and its yard is one piece. There's not, I mean, there's a tiny little bit here, but it's not a front yard and backyard. And then the the next house forms the garden wall for this one. So unlike, say, a suburban situation where a house beside a house don't give anything to each other, in fact, they have a little five-foot you know, walkway in between, this actually is an urban condition which um, improves the, uh, where the houses actually uh, benefit one another. This is just a shot of the, uh, of the, um, the yard. Um, this is Rudolf Schinder's house with Clyde Chase in, in uh, Los Angeles, and I highly recommend if you ever go. It's, it's a wonderful building. And it's, it's basically, you, you know, I, I can't, can't really explain the whole house, but it's basically these kind of uh, 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 buildings around courts. So the outdoor space, what, what's interesting about these spaces, the outdoor space is every bit as important as the indoor space. And this is very much those outdoor uh, fireplaces and so on. It's a really wonderful place. And, you know, in uh, San Solo, the Alto um, City Hall. And the University of Virginia, which is very, um, I mean, this, the lawn, which is very famous, um, they don't actually have to have conferences at the University of Virginia to, to, to fill up the housing in the summer. What happens is that uh, alumni line up and bring their families back to live on the lawn for a period of time. All summer, their families coming in. So, is there, are there any other student residences that you can imagine that happening to? And, and that, that's what happens there. This is just a quote about the single house by Charles Moore, um, late American architect. And I think it's really interesting because um, it speaks to how our codes have actually gotten in the way of, of, of appropriate urban design and 
and now won't allow something as elegant as, as that. And I guess just a couple of examples in our work where, where, where kind of the site dictates certain things. This is a, a long-term care facility we did along the St. Lawrence River, and there's this kind of very, very long veranda that goes along with, with the, and actually the opening of the home all took place along that veranda. In this uh, place, this is the uh, project at the University of Toronto at Scarborough, and I'll explain that, I'll show that later, but um, it was very much a, a building that had a very difficult program, but also was repairing the fabric of the campus. So this is, a, and this is Janet Rosenberg, she worked on this, this garden here, the space between. I'll just run through a few projects here. This is, um, and I'm not gonna cover too much of this, but we were, um, engaged uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health um, um, had an idea of creating a new campus, uh, an urban village, and there was an international competition, and uh, we with KPMB and Kearns Mancini won the competition and began work on it and are still engaged in working on it. It's a 27-acre campus, but it's like re remaking the place. And I'm just going to show you a couple of shots of the build first buildings we did. These were... Um, um, alternate milieu, which is a kind of uh, basically housing that has small dining rooms and, and, and sm small number of uh, residents. This is the site before, and it was kind of a, a campus with these uh, larger uh, object buildings on it. Again, it's much, there's a lot of complexity to this, I'm not gonna go into that, but, but essentially the um, the idea was to create, uh, extend streets into the, into, into the campus to, in fact, not only make a physical connection, but, they, but the program was going to bring other uses onto the site. So, you know, uh, retail uses, residential uses, as well as the mental health uh, facilities. This is a, one in the competition scheme. This is a, a perspective drawing showing it. And that's the... Uh, Alternatively, yeah, and there's a courtyard. The, the, the again, courtyards is the theme. Um, the courts here, and this is the old wall which uh, was preserved. Um, there was, uh, because of the memory of it and sometimes painful memory of it, there were a lot of people that wanted to take it down, but fortunately it didn't get taken down and it's actually quite elegant as a, a garden wall. Uh, this is a project we did in joint venture with Kearns Mancini. Um, Don Mount Court, which is across the Don River, um, Dundas. There were, um, and this is just a shot of a street shot, but there were, um, this, this was the project as it existed, and it was designed in, at a time when um, the, the building was built not to tie into the fabric, but as a separate building. And, uh, and this is the building fabric here. And what had happened to these structures is that they, were, they, they wouldn't have been replaced except there were some structural failures. And so there was a competition, which was a developer competition, which we hooked up. And they, there were 232 rent geared to income units. And you had to replace those and build um, whatever you needed to make it work financially. So we actually added, um, uh, I think it was 187 market units. So this is the, 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 the building beforehand. And you know, this, the, the kind of spaces around here were sort of so residual, leftover you know, parking spaces, little bits of green. Um, you know, it was really not great. So um, what we did was we uh, tied into the streets above Dundas, took them down, tied in. We consolidated the outdoor uh, spaces into a large urban park, which is, is here. Uh, there was an apartment building here. These are the um, uh, uh, market housing and then the uh, rent geared income housing is here. This is also rent geared income, but trying to integrate it to the extent possible. And it's interesting because the housing around, there's Victorian housing, and it's very difficult to try and, and, and there was pressure on us to do something that's of a traditional nature. And, and, and if you try and do sort of Victorian housing in the sort of materials that are available now, it, it just it doesn't, doesn't work. So we were looking for a sort of more robust 
um, expression. This is de Klerk's housing in South Amsterdam, and a more uh, you know Edwardian in a way. So this is uh, in the in the uh, um, the uh, market housing. These little uh, pedestrian walkways that go through. And you can see here, this is the existing street, and this is the new. And believe it or not, we had huge fights with the fire department. We just wanted to continue this straight through, and the fire department, of course, wanted to widen the road substantially, and um, that was a continuing battle. And that's just a view across the Don Valley. Um, I actually like, I like this view because it's kind of little houses on the, on the ravine. Um, this is a project which there was a, some of you may remember the publishing house, Rolf Clark Stone. They did a lot of um, books for ac academics. And uh, it was a, a factory to um, produce books. And a developer bought it, a, a suburban developer. This was the first project that they'd uh, done in the city. And we joint ventured with Chandra Graham, who we were neighbors with in our building. And uh, basically took, this is the, this is the Rolf Stark Clark Stone building we kind of took out the center part, so we kept the facade along Carla, and then we put a, a, a sort of what we call it a tower, but it's only eight stories, and then townhouses along Boston Avenue, which is this here. So what you can see here are the, this is the old building. We rebuilt the sawtooth roof, and, the, uh, and we actually used the front entry space of the old uh, publish, uh, the factory as the entry to the to the building. This is the higher building and the townhouse is there. A diagram just showing how we did that. 254 units. Those are the townhouses along Boston Avenue. Uh, the hum just two more projects. The Humber River Bridge, um, which we did some time ago, 1996. Um, there was uh, these had to be replaced uh, or fixed up substantially. And so they were just going to simply do that. And there was a great hue and cry about, you know, tr trying to get across the Humber River either as a cyclist or a pedestrian. And the irony is that the, uh, the, the bridge that we did here got built before this got repaired. And um, I, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail. There was a whole uh, uh, part of it was kind of try trying to tie into the cultural and physical history of the uh, area. I'll talk about that a little bit. Very, the structure is quite simple. The, the br bridge deck is supported by these cross beams, which are in turn supported by stainless steel rods, which are in turn supported by this arch here. So it's kind of a tripartite kind of thing. And then there, at, the, at the ends are these kind of uh, um, concrete sort of buttresses that are, that are a bit reminiscent of the old um, Queen Elizabeth Way um, monuments. Uh, this actually, the whole cross bracing up here is modeled on the Thunderbird, which was a native icon, um, a kind of ethereal icon, and we wanted to, um, part of it was trying, to t this was a trading uh, post in the, in the, for the natives in, uh, some time ago. Uh, there's a bicycle rail and handrail, and these are the, uh, the, the beams with the stainless steel rods going up. The last project I'm going to talk about is the University of Toronto at Scarborough. Um, we actually had done a project called the Dead Center Project, and I'll explain that, a study earlier, and then we competed and were hired to do this project. And it's a very crucial point at the entrance to the campus from Military Trail comes in here. There's a student center here, and you come in uh, along there. The program for the building actually is complex. There's uh, classrooms, there's art and music studios, there's academic offices, there's uh, registration, uh, there's a welcome center, and there is a, a, um, the uh, seat of governance, the council chamber. But and this is the, the building uh, that was called Scarborough College that John Andrews did, which was at its time on the front of just about every uh, international architectural magazine in the world, and uh, was a very important building. The building that had taken place since then, actually one that the Andrews did, the Bladen building and some of the other building, was pretty not nearly to that standard. 
However, the, the campus has become denser now, and there's some very good buildings by uh, you know, architects that you all know of that have, have you know, made the place much more um, pedestrian friendly and much, much better. But our building was kind of trying to continue the crescent of the Andrews building. This is the science, uh, science wing here, the humanities wing here, around this woods, and to kind of welcome people coming in here. Um, this is the council chamber here. And we wanted to remake all this space. This was the sort of dead center. I'll show you what that looked like. This is what it looked like. I mean, that's what they had as the sign. Can you imagine for the uh, um, other building? And just this kind of really nasty um, plaza that hadn't had anything done to it. So we inserted this, but we inserted in such a way that we made uh, garden gardens and in different places, so that we were repairing the fabric. We have an indoor walkway along here, cross pass there, and an outdoor connection there. So this is the garden that uh, I said that Janet Rosenberg did here. This is the connection. With it, which is the covered walkway here. This is that green roof that you saw. This is the woods beyond. This is the council chamber. So that you know you have this path coming through here, connecting this way. Uh, the 300 seat lecture theater here, welcome center, and so on and so forth. So it really was as much about the spaces, the places between, as it was about you know satisfying a, a fairly. Uh, um, demanding program. And here you can see the walkway looking out under the, under the coast, the, the, the trees, and waiting for the, uh, the lecture. Um, that's just some of the credits. I, my wife and I were in uh, Alaska recently, and uh, coming home we were in Anchorage, because that's where we were flying out of, and we were in a little shuttle person shuttle and there was a, I asked the driver what the population of uh, Anchorage was and she said 300,000 people and without a moment's hesitation she said three Costco's, two Walmarts and a safe easy and I thought well you know uh, maybe it's not surprising but it's pretty depressing and I, I, I guess I would hope the sort of notion of civic values like place and occasion and, and others will prevail as a more kind of nuanced currency uh, and bring more timeless and civic, civic qualities to both um, buildings and cities. Thank you.